The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. Time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your hosts, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mike Tusa from KnowYourOptionsInc.com. And John Grigas from Options Express. Welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Network and our latest show, The Option Block. I believe we're up to episode four now, if I am not mistaken. So we're, we're climbing the ropes. And if you count all those sneak previews, then we're up to about nine or ten. So we're cranking. We're cranking through the shows. And we have our full complement of panelists tonight. John has been called away for pressing expiration news, but Rob is more than capably spilling in for him today, so we expect big things from him today, so I'm going to put most of the show on his shoulders. <laughs> and with that worried laugh, we will dive right into the trading block. The trading block. And welcome to the trading block. This is the segment of the show where we discuss some of the interesting trading activity we're seeing going on in the market right now or that we saw going on in this session. And today was an interesting day. Broad indices didn't move that much. We had S&P up about 8 around closing and the Dow up about 77. We saw some interesting movement post Citigroup. Citigroup seemed to contribute a lot to that rally. That stock was up about 4% today after beating most consensus estimates. Of course, if you parse those numbers a bit, and uh, then things start to get a a little less rosy for Citigroup. Their third quarter net income was up. Credit loss provisions were were down, so they had to write off fewer bad loans, but their revenue was also down because consumer lending weakens. We also saw Halliburton today. They're down about 5% after coming out mixed and disappointing a lot of the analysts. So the oil services sector not looking too strong today. And the stocks were up today despite a relatively bearish signal coming out in the manufacturing area with manufacturing down about two-tenths of a percent. That's the first drop since the recession officially ended at the end of last summer. So overall, the news was a little mixed, and yet the uh, the market seemed to shrug it off. And right now, we are actually in the process of watching good old IBM, the old tech bellwether, now kind of. I wouldn't say tech also ran, but still, there's still a potent force in the tech world. But they're no Google, we'll say that. Let's get a live, quote-unquote, live-to-tape update of what IBM is doing right now. They just come out with earnings. If stock closed at 142.83 and they're trading 139 in the after hours right now. So yeah, it's I'll, down almost exactly four bucks right yeah. now. So uh, people obviously not it's liking, heading lower. Yeah, people not liking what uh, IBM had to say. We'll keep you updated on IBM throughout the show. We're obviously going to discuss them a little bit later in mm-hmm. the odd block as well. What do you guys have anything else you're looking at right now? You know, Apple earnings after the bell, uh, you know, we're waiting on those. Uh, not seeing anything there. was pricing in, uh, you know, a pretty decent move. A uh, few other, you know, we got a lot of stocks, a lot of LBO rumors coming out. There's a lot of companies being, that people are trying to take things private. Because they think, uh, you know, good companies are cheap to buy and bad companies are, you know, well, bad companies maybe just are bad. But good, a lot of people think good companies are, are a cheap buy right now. So seeing some of that. Speaking of Apple, I just pulled them up and they closed at 318 today. I, Unbelievable. We were just no. talking about them a, a show or two ago and they were like 290, 295. And people were, we were debating whether that was already too rich. And now they're at almost 320. Uh, and the after hours are down a buck, so 317, but still. Well, 
Stocks only go up. You didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to be a little reminiscent of the old, uh, you know, 98, 99, when people would say to you, and it's, what does stock do? And you say, it didn't matter. You know, it's an Internet stock. What is, who cares? You know, this is yeah. a, uh, this is a uh, tech hardware stock, or it's just Apple. Who cares? They sell Apple. Yeah, a- Apple thinks it's 1998, apparently. Yeah, th- that is just unbelievable. And I- I've been telling people, this is actually interesting. Um, there are a lot of index traders out there and options, right? And... I've got these guys that were trading different types of, like, income spreads in the NDX, and I told them all they had to stop until the NDX could rebalance itself, because right now Apple is way too big a portion of the NDX to actually trade the NDX. Um, if you're trading you're the NDX, trading Apple right now. <laughs> you're trading 20% of the value of the NDX is Apple, 20%. So... If you are a index trader, you have to steer clear of the NDX because you're really just trading Apple along with the other things. I mean, but it's it's pretty kind of silly how it's structured right now. So, you know, you're probably better off trading Apple because <laughs> then at least you can focus in on one yeah. one thing. Yeah, a pure uh, there. So that would be one thing I've warned. And then the other thing I was reading about this. And you know I'm not a bond guy, but maybe some of some of uh, someone else can comment on that. I guess the spread between the the ten year and the thirty year is at a some sort of ridiculous high right now. Full disclosure: I am a massive long term bond shorter. All right, I I don't I think you have to sell bonds with rates this low, even if rates don't increase. They're certainly not going a lot, a lot lower, you know. Yeah, they're they're saying the spread between. I'm just looking here. The spread between the 10 year and the 30 year is 140 basis points. So that is that is that seems pretty rich. <laughs> that's <bad>. yeah. <laughs> well, I see uh, a lot of a lot of that is uh, everybody expecting. Uh, the, the Fed to keep on dumping more of that helicopter money into the economy via the uh, the asset buyback program, and uh, we're we're just not seeing any let up in the bond market. Every time we we see uh, bonds starting to come back a little bit, it, you know they they just find some more buyers to come in, and that's that's the Fed basically uh, we're officially keeping the uh, the bond market propped up. Yeah, it's amazing how that is. Like right now for our portfolio allocations over at Know Your Options. Uh, in in the past, we have had exposure to longer-term bonds just as a, a portion of the portfolio. But right now, uh, the longest-term bond exposure that we have for any of our clients is three years. And basically, the reason that we have that is just it's a, it, we're looking for a glorified money market at times. And uh, with bonds up at the levels that they are right now, uh, just from our standpoint, uh, in the area of a portfolio, it just doesn't make sense to be in any longer-term bonds at all for having to hold your money for that long of a time frame and only getting that small amount of a yield. It just it doesn't make sense to us at this stage for any of our clients. Now, particularly yeah. with rates down here, I mean, unless, unless you're going to negative rates, I don't see much of a much of an upside in the immediate near term for for bonds. Yeah, and. And you know what, for those of us, you know, I was having a conversation with my father last week, uh, and we were kind of talking about the bond market. Uh, my dad used to be really involved with the bond market, um, just to put it, you know, to shortly. Um, and we were kind of d- discussing things, and he was, you know, yeah, this is kind of like, it, it, it's like we're in 1982, except everything is completely flipped, all right? In 1982, my dad was telling me this story about how he's on the phone talking to um, talking to clients, telling them they've got to buy this 30-year because it's paying 16%. they got to buy the 30-year. It's paying 16%. And then the next week, it goes to 16 and a half. And then he's on the phone. And, and some people listened, and some people said, fat, and went to, you know, short term, and they felt the, the, uh, the power of reinvestment risk. Now we're actually kind of the opposite way where you have massive reinvestment risk from the other side. If you can't reinvest right now, you are going to, you are set up for a real problem. Uh, as far as interest rates go, 
I have trouble imagining that you can't sell bonds here and then it, over the next 10 years beat the long-term interest rate price into the 30-year. Uh, now, for those of us that, don't, that are saying, Mark, I'm not walking down to the Federal Reserve and selling bonds or, you know, I don't want to go and open a big futures account at the Board of Trade and sell futures that way. There are some interesting ETF bond funds. And the neat thing is, is that the, the, because bonds are kind of a lower volatility, uh, you don't have some of that kind of reinvestment and crazy readjustment risk with some of the double and triple shorts as well. So if you're looking to just get single short bonds, the ProShares 20 plus year treasury fund, TBF, is a good way to do it. Full disclosure, I own some of it. If you're looking to get double short, then uh, TBT, I believe, is the uh, – is it TBT or TLT? It's TBT. Uh, TBT. Yeah. TLT is the long-term long. Yeah. TBT is a good way – is the double short. Now, they have the triple short. I, I, I just don't see it. So, you know, I was having a conversation with a guy who's got a couple of very small children, and he said, well, Mark – what would what would you put in there? You know, my kids are three and one. What would I what should I what would I buy in their four hundred one k's? Now, obviously, I, I'm not an advisor. I'm not registered. But I said, you know what I'm doing in my uh, IRA? I'm buying TBF and I'm buying TBT. And the guy thought it was a really uh, really interesting thing because. My time frame is, you know, 20 years. Or, well, hopefully my time frame is two years, but my realistic time frame is I'm going to be working for a while. And so long term, I have no problem buying some of these these uh, short treasury funds. I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts? You know, right now the, the Fed is really hard-pressed. I mean, they're, they're up against the wall because they can't lower interest rates any further. Uh, so they're – they're injecting this liquidity, and essentially, you know, the government is is just writing up debt or racking up debt at a at a you know breakneck speed. So the the Fed's letting them do it a lot cheaper by by buying up bonds, and and this is kind of a short term, uh, hopefully a short term uh, push to uh, to increase liquidity and uh, give us some of that uh, helicopter money. As uh, people like to put it, and uh, you know, we, it's just not sustainable. I mean, the the, the Fed just can't uh, keep on buying up all these all these bonds and letting the government finance cheaply. So eventually, it is something that that's going to crack. But you know, this is we're kind of in the same type of scenario as late 2008, where where bonds are going up and and people are are attempting to short bonds. You know, it it's really tough to uh, you know when when the Fed is taking some sort of action and they're artificially propping up a market like the bond market right now, mm-hmm. it's really hard to step in front of that bus right now. So it really uh, is. Uh, so doing something longer term, uh, non leveraged is, is a great way to balance a portfolio like TBF. But it, it's really tough to to pick where the top of this bond market is because every time the market shows. Uh, Show some of trying to pull it back. Fresh money comes in, and the Fed steps up their their buying of uh, treasuries and other assets. Yeah, for those people who who didn't uh, cut their teeth on on the floor of the SIBO or some of the other exchanges out there, you know, stepping in front of the Fed. I mean, you used to have a saying, you know, when those big big trades came in, you didn't want to get in front of. It was like stepping in front of the train, you know. The, and the Fed is definitely the train, and this is you do not want to get run over. You do not want to get in the way of whatever the Fed is doing. So if, if they're coming in on the other side of the paper, you want to get the heck out of the way. So, yeah, coming in on the other side of the Fed on this one is definitely dangerous. And just for a quick recap here, I've been watching uh, Apple and IBM while we're talking. And Apple just dipped down below three, 316 strikes, so they're hitting in the 315 range. They're kind of bounding back up now. But So they were trending lower quite a bit, and IBM's down about 4 bucks still. So they're still kind of stabilizing. I haven't seen any uh, consensus yet on what Apple pulled out so far, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait a little longer for that. But been watching them a little bit while we've been been chatting. All right, and with that, we'll head into the odd block. The odd block. 
And welcome to the Odd Block. This is the section of the show where we discuss some of the interesting or unusual options activity that we've seen at the tape. And uh, I probably shouldn't mention the top of the show, but I am actually recording remotely from poolside down in Palm Beach today. So I haven't been digging into the tape too extensively. They, they, don't, they don't bring me my tickers with my Mai Tais down here. A few uh, interesting names we've seen coming across the tape today. We're going to start off with Lincoln National. Or LNC, they closed around twenty five ninety four, up eighty five cents, and they saw a lot of spec activity in the morning, with a lot of bulls coming in, picking up in droves. The front month twenty six through twenty eight calls. I started saying October, forgetting that we are one day past expiration now. So yeah, so front month being November, these traders came in and, and scooped up approximately two thousand or so each of these strikes, twenty six through twenty eight. We saw the uh, no twenty six is going up for about a dollar twenty. The Nov 27s for 80 cents. I don't have the price off the top of my head here for the Nov 28s, but it was all about in that same ballpark. That gapped up the overall volume in LNC to about four times its average daily volume. We also, not surprisingly, saw a spike in vol about 4% today due to all this, this scooping up of Nov calls. And the bulk of this seems to be coming from a, uh, some rumors of takeovers lurking here. I know the guys over at Fly on the Wall were chattering about this possibly being a takeover mm-hmm. target. And they've got earnings in a few weeks, so, and so, but it looks like a lot of people are specking on a, on a takeover coming for LNC. Yeah, the rumor out there is uh, some sort of private equity leverage buyout um, of uh, Link. And then there was also a possible, uh, there was a couple of public companies that were also kind of discussed in the uh, in the process. Yeah, you know, the the buying just didn't stop all day. Up, you know, people were just buying every single call they could get. Um, the company has earnings coming up. The company might get bought out. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons to possibly buy calls in this. And that's what we saw today. With that, we will move on to GE, good old General Electric. They closed around 16 and a quarter, so pretty much unchanged on the day. And what we saw in here was, Kind of uh, the reverse of some of the some of the unusual activity we noted last show, with a lot of our w- people coming in and closing out winners and maybe rolling them to different strikes. This was a guy who took a huge flyer about a week or so ago on the uh, November 19 strike, and he came in and gobbled up 105,000 no 19 calls for an 11 for 11 cents a piece. So these are pretty much what we call lottery ticket options. These this guy was just mm-hmm. betting on a huge upside move. In front month, uh, so he he thought this thing was he was just taking a pure flyer, and he came out today and in the opening session dumped them all for a penny. So obviously he was disgusted and that trade didn't work out very well. He was taking a bet obviously on GE's earnings, and that didn't work out that well. On Friday the stock was down about five percent. The company reported you know better than expected, but as usual once you start parsing the numbers things get a little less rosy, and current sales for industrial equipment actually disappointed. So this year's are down about 5%, and this guy's lottery tickets went to zero pretty much. Or and he much. blew a million dollars. Pretty much, yeah. It's a good lesson on lottery tickets. A million dollars he spent. Yeah. A million dollars. You know, it was probably some ridiculous fund out there where the guy had some access to some capital and he wanted to just take a flyer, and maybe his risk manager didn't see it, or maybe they just don't know or they're ignorant, mm-hmm. and they let him take this uh, ridiculous bet. And he got what right. he deserved. <laughs> right. You throw well, a million dollars. Right. You throw a million dollars on you know on on these way out of the money you know way upside calls and and before earnings and you kind of deserve what you get. Yeah, he basically said put a million on red on on thirty nine. Yeah. You know, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't even a million on red. It was on thirty nine. You're right. Yeah, well, I don't think there's thirty nine on the uh, on the. Uh, the state. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I think it's 38. <laughs> he, he bet on triple zero in this case. It was just exactly. pure, pure loser on this one. I know. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> we always mock lottery ticket traders on here because that's what we like to do. That's just silliness. All right. And then moving on to Whirlpool, WHR. I know, Mark, you've been following this one pretty aggressively while I've been being a lazy man down by the pool. And it looks mm-hmm. like there was a lot, of, a lot of customers coming in buying the – the Dees 90 par, uh, was that a call spread going up there? Yeah, it's a one-by-two call spread. We I saw a lot of actual upside buying in this thing. They've got earnings coming up on the 27th. Uh, we saw some decent buying in November. And then what I thought was an interesting trade, 
because it's kind of telling of where this guy thinks the stock is going, is he bought 1,900 of the 90 calls and then sold about 3,900 of the 100 calls. So he thinks this stock is going up, but he doesn't think it's going up 20, 30 um, percent. And, and that's why I really like seeing – But he's a sensible fellow, you're saying, then. Well, you know, it's nice when these guys actually kind of telegraph what they're trying – what they think and what they're trying to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does, because it makes it a little easier to parse what they're up to for the most part. Yeah. I mean, this guy straight up thinks that the stock is going to, you know, somewhere in between probably 97 and 100 and 103, 102. Um, obviously, this guy makes his most at 100 and starts to lose money. He ended up paying – uh, an average of about 98 cents. So this trade becomes a loser above 109. So uh, when I see something like that, you know, I see that as, as smart paper actually trying to put on a, what they think is a smart trade. So Let's contrast this to our friend in GE, which was the yeah. definition of not smart paper. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, this, this guy, he's it's realistic in that – uh, if you look at Whirlpool, it hasn't touched 110 for almost five months from now, so why not sell that type of premium? I mean, obviously, you'll have the upside risk to where you're going to uh, start losing the money should you not own the stock, but uh, if he also owns the stock, that's a great way to get double leverage if you're bullish on the stock. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't even think about the double leverage factor. Uh, they have they have earnings coming up on the 27th, so he's, right. he's got a little bit of a ways to go. Mm-hmm. You know, also uh, just a little I'll do a little quick update here. Let's see where our friends are trading right now. We've IBM. Got, IBM is last I checked, it was still down about four. It's down five now. now five. It's down about five bucks. Yeah, five dollars. It's going to be below about 135 bucks. I'm almost certain. That was um, that before the show, both for this and for Apple. <laughs> this one's a little, a little bit higher probability of paying off. <laughs> well, uh, I was chatting with Mark before the show, and I, I Mark was talking to Mark before the show, and I said, Mark, he said, yes, Mark. I said, I think that tomorrow the opening mark on IBM will be below 135. What do you think of that, Mark? And he said, Mark, um, <laughs> Sorry, I guess. This is like I a very, that. very, very bad who's on first, you know? I know. <laughs> now, do you guys want to market it to market? Oh. Oh. No. <laughs> now, um, I was looking at the paper today, and we saw a couple of things. Any, almost every trade over 100 lot was buying, was buying. Just straight up buying. And they were buying puts, they were buying calls, but mostly buying puts. And they were buying... You know, all of the kind of way out of the money stuff that you'll see people taking bets on was done at the 135 and the 130 strike. Not very much 150 buying, not very much 155 buying. Um, you know, the big trade was the uh, the 140, 145 strangle. Bought up and down by, you know, all day. It was trading around $5. Uh, made me think, okay, well, we're probably going to be going to about 135 based on the strangle. That was that was going for five bucks. Well, that that's uh, that's fairly rich for for uh, yeah. front month right before earnings. Yeah, that's that's. Oh really- yeah, the vol was really pumped, and, and they were almost goading you to sell the double calendar. You know, that's tempting and, at that point when you got a five dollar strangle. Looks like that means that still is even with the stock down five points. That's still a winner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the double the strangle would have been a winner right here. Um, and if you unload the stock at this point, you're probably fine. Um, we'll see where the thing goes. I think it's going to have more problems in the morning. That's my bet. So, um, but yeah, it was really interesting. Looking at the paper flow was very telling about what people thought. And it said it's going to move and it's probably going to be down. You know, so interesting. Yeah, that is an interesting trade to see that much size coming in and, and scooping up a comparatively expensive strangle mm-hmm. right before earnings like this. Obviously, there was a lot of a uh, lot of spec that this sucker is going to be moving quite a bit, probably to the downside. If they're leaning on the yeah. 40 that way, but yeah, that's could have interesting. Been, could have been Google Hangover though. Yeah, true. And we will, we will get into Google more. I don't want to step all over uh, Rob's spread block. We will get into Google in depth and what the uh, what the OX boys think about Google, but. Um, 
And then the kind of, we touched on Apple again, and we're looking at Apple. So Apple is kind of, uh, unless my quotes. I don't think they've, I don't oh. think they've, uh, they, I don't they've think halted they've it. Yeah, that, yeah, say they've halted. I was just going to say, because all of a sudden I'm back to unched, and uh, they were, yeah. they were trading down about two and a half. They were trading much down, pretty much they had given up everything they made today, all, almost three points, and now it's kind of halted. So it looks like they just, uh, have just come out with that one. So that's Yeah, let me pull up, uh, time and sales for Apple, and I'll take a little look here. And the last just, I saw was, it was six, 316 by 316.20. And uh, then it kind of just froze. Looking at the numbers, they they killed the street. Uh, net income four sixty four versus two seventy seven. Yeah, the uh, street is always terrible, though. I mean, you can't even look at those numbers. Just, just the man who writes for the street. There we go. No, I don't mean the street dot com. <laughs> That's not what he was saying. By the way, full disclosure, I wrote about uh, I wrote a where a uh, whirlpool trade for the street today. Um, no, I, you know the that the numbers that we get from kind of the the co- collective analysts are always old. They're you know late to the party, and you know talking to everybody. The the, the day of the analyst is over, in my opinion. I, I don't see I, you know it's all about what is actually happening, not. You're not, oh, this might happen because I think it's been proven over and over again how wrong these guys are. And this is just another example of them either not updating their numbers, um, not being up to date with what was going on with the product. I mean, it's uh, – The system has been broken for a long time. They tried to fix it a bit when they – untie the analysts from the eye banking and stuff, but it still is very much predicated on how cozy the analyst is with the company, because if he's not very cozy with them, they're not going to give him accurate, reliable data, you know? They're not going to show him around, give him access to all the numbers he needs to do his job. So uh, it, these numbers, yeah, and Microsoft mastered this game a long time ago, back in the, the go-go tech 90s. They would consecutively beat the street every quarter, because they had they mastered the game of talking down expectations very well, and I think Apple has definitely stolen a page from their playbook on that because they are consecutively just talking down numbers and then blowing past these these talk down numbers quite a bit. Exactly. Well, and I think analysts are late to update things as well. Yeah, I, I think. That, well, you're seeing some some people uh, rush in and uh, update their their estimates for the for kind of the wrong reasons. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to mention the analyst's name, but one of the, the large tech analysts. Oh, mention yeah. names. Why not? Let's just come on. Let's just light the fire here. Fuck, 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 But uh, as soon as Apple, uh, as soon as Google uh, reported earnings last week, and and we saw him up sixty bucks in uh, in pre market trading, all, all of a sudden he he doubled his or uh, doubled his increase in in his Apple uh, objective to three thirty five. Oh so, wow! Uh, as soon as and for no other reason that that Google just absolutely killed the street. <laughs> you know, I frequently say, and we're seeing this a lot now in the derivative space as well, where now that a lot of these companies are public companies, analysts have flooded into the space and then talking with them and working with them extensively on the derivatives and exchange and brokerage space, you get a really good realization that these guys are are really little better than reporters on these spaces in the sense that. They're assigned to a sector. Usually they have very little insider understanding of that sector. They're just assigned to it. Usually they have multiple ones that they follow, and they kind of gobble together whatever they can from the outside looking in. But it's a very rare case where you have an analyst who is very deeply experienced in the sector that he's covering and, and knows all the ins and outs of these various things. I, I, I'm about to really insult analysts. I was talking to one the other day. Um, <laughs> prepare that edit button. Um, I was talking to one uh, the other day, and by the time sh- this person had gotten done talking, I was shocked that this person didn't need to think to breathe. That's how dumb I thought they were. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, and speaking of Apple, just to talk about how oversaturated this company is, I was reading something today for a new car release from Hyundai. Hyundai is trying to break into the luxury vehicle class with some, you know, massively expensive new car to compete with BMW and Lexus. And one of their key selling points for this new car is it comes with a free iPad. The owner's manual is on an iPad. And that to me, uh, that to me was just a sign that, okay, we've really hit the saturation point. Apple's got to be on the downturn. When, it's, when your owner's manual is coming and iPad comes in your glove box, uh, what, what, is left to, <laughs> what is left at that point for that company? Yeah, you guys have been saying this, though, since 270. I know. 
right. <laughs> obviously, we're not we're not in on the uh, don't listen to us. Obviously, because we're not in on the, <laughs> on the Apple Love Fest. So, in my defense, I think it was around two ninety five. I started saying that, but maybe it was a little lower. I don't know. Meanwhile, we're saying all this crap and two saws silently biling calls one at a time, <laughs> loading up. Yeah. Oh. Full disclosure, I do have clients in Apple on longer term positions, but uh, this is one to where. I think what, like I said last week, I think what's been driving it, it's not been in the United States. I do think it's saturated in the United States. I just think that what's been driving it lately has been more their overseas market. And um, in terms of, like, how far that's going to go, I think that's a big question mark. For for the United States, I think no doubt they are. It's, It's a very saturated company without a doubt. But overseas, though, there is that wild card factor that has been driving them up ever since the uh, naysayers named Mark have been talking them down. I think that's about the wild card. Talking them down. I just I like the company. I just don't like it at three hundred and twenty bucks. Um, the iPad is not. You know, the iPad just. It, I don't think it's going to work for corporations. It just especially because they're all built on the Windows system, and the iPad is not. So. I just don't see how it's going to work. Here's here's the truth about Apple here is that this company has undergone a seismic shift in the past couple of years, and it's even reflected in their name. They're no longer Apple Computer. They're Apple, and they've gone from a desktop and laptop kind of a niche product house to a massive consumer electronics company, and now they they play in a different arena, and they also have different competitors now. And look at yeah. – you can say what you like, but the Apple's fairly priced at 318. There are arguments on both sides of, of defense. But I, you can't tell me if you look a year down the road from now with so many new competitors coming in the arena. We're going to talk about Microsoft and their new announcement recently in a little bit and around the block and uh, how the rumors are they're putting a billion dollars behind their new consumer electronics initiative to push it in terms of marketing. And their Android is outselling these iPhones at a ridiculous pace. And so – for every one Hyundai that comes with an iPad in the glove box, you have so many competitors at lower price points that are just going to, by just coming together, they're going to carve away at so many little pieces of this market. I, I personally foresee it kind of playing out back in the old days when it was Mac versus PC, and PC was the dominant platform for most people, and Mac was a niche premium product for a handful of select enthusiasts. I think Apple's eventually going to go back to that way. They will still have this premium consumer electronics product with great UI, great interface, all these things, but it will be for a select group of users, whereas everyone else will have Android or Windows 7 or something else like that. And so, I mean, that's my own personal opinion. If you guys love Apple, feel free to load up a 320. I I shan't be partaking in that trade. Uh, Well, actually, I think that what Microsoft has been doing with this Windows Phone 7 is – has been a reaction to uh, to the iPhone because I think that they're they're seeing all these new products come to market and they're realizing that you know a few years down the road desktop PC it may not be what everybody is using. I mean we're seeing more and more of us here at work sitting around playing around on our smartphones using uh, using different products and they're they're seeing that that market share kind of slip away. And once you get to, I mean, Microsoft doesn't want to turn into basically a server company where they're they're building server technology and letting other operating systems run all over it. You know, I I agree. that I think they are completely reactionary. But that's always been Microsoft's MO is reactionary. They're a monopoly. They can afford to be reactionary. Look at, they completely missed the Internet. I think Bill Gates wrote a book in 1995 called The Way Ahead. Never, not a man. I'm glad I got short Apple at 320 a minute ago. Did it hit 320? Uh, 294 right now. Oh, oh wow. There we go. 135 is looking better there. Uh, looks yeah, well, you might, you might come... What did I tell you? <laughs> what did I tell you? Yeah, they just opened it I up. I told you those analysts, don't even look. You you might as well had, you're better off asking, like, my nine-month-year-old, the, the, the garbled dot, dot, dot that comes out of his mouth is a more valuable assessment of Apple's earnings estimates than what's coming out of analyst's mouth. Yeah, this, uh, looking at here, the Nove 320 straddle went out at about 32, and it looks like that might that might, that might might actually pay off uh, if this uh, this trend continues here in uh, in Apple, because they're looking, uh, looking down pretty hard right now. So maybe, maybe people are finally starting to listen to the show and wake up and realize <laughs> that, hey, they're, they've been slamming Apple, maybe it's time to listen. 
but <laughs> I think that's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on that. And I think with that, we will close out the odd block here. And uh, or should I call it the uh, the tech odd block today because we were pretty heavy on, on tech or the the or, or the or the curmudgeon block. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> Everything is in my day. Get off my lawn. Um, all right. <laughs> With that, we will move on into the spread slash express block. The spread block brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade futures and now foreign futures too, where and when you want. From advanced charting and free daily trading ideas to automated systems trading and free educational resources, Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Visit OptionsExpress.com to open your free account. Futures involve substantial risk and are not appropriate for all investors. Please read this disclosure statement for futures and options available at optionsexpress.com slash futures risk or by calling 1-888-280-8020 prior to applying for an account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. And welcome to the Express Block. This is the section of the show where we all sit back and allow Rob to regale us with his wisdom on what is happening over at the Options Express customer book. So, Rob, take it away and regale us. Yeah, it's funny. And we were just talking uh, about two uh, two subjects I was going to hit on, and uh, that is the analyst estimate and uh, you know the uh, Google and, and Apple correlation. Uh, now, uh, we had a lot of customers, uh, prior to, uh, Google's announcement on, on Thursday, and we like to, uh, tear into those, uh, those lottery ticket buyers. Usually when, when Google comes out with earnings, we see these, uh, uh, these ridiculous, uh, option premiums and this volatility spike. And, uh, well, one of the, uh, the top stocks that, uh, we had a lot of customers have, have interest in, and this is actually, a company where uh, the the average Joe uh, outperformed the analyst and the professional trader. Uh, we saw quite a few people um, outside the company selling the the 540 straddle uh, prior to earnings because last few earnings uh, seasons uh, Google has kind of had these tight ranges that were tight ranges that we're not accustomed to, and uh, we didn't have anybody really buying the 540 straddle, but we did have. A lot of people buying the the 560 570 uh, bull call spread, and some of these uh, these further out kind of lottery ticket uh, bull call spreads on Google, and uh, they certainly didn't disappoint this uh, <laughs> this last week. Yeah, those paid off huge. Where did that straddle uh, go out before earnings? The 540 straddle. Where was it trading for? It was trading for 25 points. Well, actually, we did we actually didn't have a lot of them, but I saw a lot of them go off the board last week. And, uh, that was, uh, in the trading and execution area, uh, we were kind of debating and I don't think anybody had the, uh, uh, the guts before earnings to actually pull the trigger. And, you know, we had pretty good arguments on both sides of, uh, shorting the straddle versus, uh, buying the straddle. And, uh, you know, Google has kind of set the bar high. I think what we're seeing right now with Apple is, uh, every call we've had this morning, it, when, when I got in this morning, it, Every other call has been Apple related, and I think that you know, the, the Google earnings kind of had that spillover effect, and uh, we saw these kind of unreasonable expectations. We saw the huge jump on, on Friday on Apple, and again, it was higher today before the earnings announcement, and I think that we saw a lot of unrealistic expectations because it's down uh, over 19 bucks now in, in extended hours trading. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, people have got Google fever, I guess. And there is there is a lot more overlay these days between Google and Apple than there were, you know, it was just a few years ago. They're competing more directly. Obviously, they both make handsets or handset operating systems now. It was weird that Google CEO was on Apple's board until about a year ago, which I always thought was kind of strange right. because they yeah. were they were essentially developing competing phones, and yet this guy is sitting in on Apple's innermost secrets while they're making their own competing products. That always seemed a little odd to me, and they finally woke up to that reality. But, yeah, they're becoming more and more 
competitors now, and, and also they're, they're kind of moving in lockstep in a lot of these markets. So I think people see them tied at the hip a lot more than they were. Right, and, and it's advertising. It's the mobile advertising that they're both really competing in as well. And uh, you know, with Google buying AdMob, uh, you know, they're they're paying for those clicks, and uh, or they're getting paid for all those clicks. And uh, I think that that's kind of where you're seeing the differing business models uh, between the two uh, on the on the iTunes store, or the uh, the iStore. We're seeing a lot of uh, a lot more pay apps. Where Google, a lot of their developers are actually they're they're offering free ad or free ad based apps, and I think that uh, Google is doing really well in that regard and and getting paid for all those clicks and people accidentally click on on those uh, ads when they're opening up their apps. Uh, but uh, I think that we're the opinion was that you know Apple really uh, controls where they're. Uh, where their products are sold, uh, as opposed to, to Google, where you know you can you can buy Android-based phones on virtually any carrier. Uh, there are a lot of people out there thinking maybe Apple is sandbagging their numbers, and you know we saw the uh, the numbers you previously mentioned, where Android is way outpacing uh, the iPhone as far as sales, and and there are some some traders out there wondering if. Maybe Apple wasn't pulling the Microsoft into just kind of, you know, span sandbagging those numbers because in the U.S. the only place you can get an iPhone is through AT&T, and it's uh, it's very similar in Europe. They have uh, T-Mobile and I forget what other carrier, uh, but they they have a lot of control over um, their uh, their sales or where their, their products are sold, and you're kind of wondering if uh, maybe they didn't. Uh, Sandbank those numbers just a little bit to uh, to uh, surprise everybody with their earnings announcement today, and seeing how the market reacted, I think uh, surprise a lot of was experience. not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the surprise they had in store was not good. Well, that, that kind of rumor has been swirling around for a while with Apple because they're not a they're not a bashful company. If they're they're doing well, they will put out releases. And for the first few months, they were putting out a lot of releases about iPad sales, iPad sales, and then the expectations started to creep up from all these analysts, and they started getting higher. And all of a sudden, we stopped seeing that flow of information uh, out of um, various iPad sales and iPhone sales. And so most of the numbers you've had for the past few months have been just, you know, garbage analyst estimates. There's been very little hard data coming out of Apple, and maybe maybe that saw, they saw this plume of expectation expanding ahead of them and knew that was going to bite them pretty quick, and so they decided to stop uh, putting out the numbers. Because that's always been when they stop trumpeting their success, it makes you maybe wonder maybe things aren't as uh, – obviously the thing is a ridiculous success, the iPad, but maybe it's not as – astronomical as some of these giddy analysts thought it was going to be. Well, and, and changing their market standards, where they they went to uh, they, they loosened their standards for their uh, for their app developers as far as far as putting apps out on the market. Uh, that was kind of a sign that maybe the the walled garden is coming down a little bit, and uh, they're starting to trim those hedges. Uh, mm-hmm. So that to try to attract more uh, more traders or more uh, more app developers, and uh, they're seeing Google as more and more of a threat. And I think that they see uh, Windows Mobile, uh, the the new Windows Phone, is is possibly another threat because of the uh, the enterprise integration between Google and Apple, and now with Microsoft playing in this space some more. It is interesting to watch them, and I'm just kind of looking at, like I said, you were talking about that Google 540 straddle, and those guys. I think it opened up around what 48 the next day or something along those lines. So all those 25 level sellers, yeah, to get back to them, they uh, they took a bit of a hit. <laughs> I hope, yeah. Hopefully, you guys didn't lose too many accounts on that one. No, it, and we really stayed alongside. You know, a lot of our clients are they're very weary of, of getting on the, on the short side of many of these technology stocks going into earnings. Uh, yeah, sometimes you get you get some traders that are very cute and they they try to sell all that volatility. But you know, a lot of times that comes back to bite you. Uh, I mean, you can't go you can't go naked and uh, and be unprotected like that uh, going into an earning earnings announcement. Uh, you know, we we often see it on the other side where you know we're we're explaining uh, the role that volatility has to play with with option pricing going into an earnings announcement. And you know, why is the stock up five dollars and my call is down fifty cents? 
and uh, you know we saw it go the other way this this past uh, <laughs> this past Thursday and Friday. Um, you know, we, it had a spillover effect on Apple. We saw a lot of people buying uh, relatively inexpensive uh, lottery tickets in the, in the weekly options, so they're not buying quite as much time as the November options. And uh, obviously, those are uh, those are bets that are probably not going to pay off unless uh, Apple does something miraculous here on the uh, uh, overnight. No, it's down 21 points now in the overnight. And speaking of spillover, that's spilling over into Google right now. Google's down about 12 points. It's actually printing in the 610 range, and it could be down about seven points right now. So that, that definitely the Apple Google convergence is is, <laughs> is is hurting them right now with traders yep. dragging down uh, Google as well with the Apple announcement. Unless you guys have anything else, we're running a bit long here, so we're going to dive right into the strategy block. <laughs> The strategy block. And the strategy block is a segment of the show where, like I said last week, we grab a cup of ale and we sit around the campfire and we listen to Days of Old with Mike Tussaw. And Mike, what do we have on the nostalgia docket today? Well, back in my day, Sonny, we used no. <laughs> So first off, full disclosure, I didn't really short Apple at 320. I wish I would have, but uh, wow. uh, that was, you know, I, I knew I knew you didn't think I, you know, I, I figured I'd just want to come clean with that. I really didn't do that, but um, Aww. yeah, they're like, ah, oh, well, man, but you know, seeing see his trading was halted, yeah. I don't think they probably believed me that much anyway. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I. Uh, I'm waiting for a pullback is probably a, a, something that maybe you've heard from either yourself in your own trading, uh, maybe your financial advisor, maybe a trading coach, or uh, just maybe even an analyst, so to speak. When you're looking for a stock trade and something is on maybe a, uh, it's a pretty bullish run, maybe you like XYZ stock at 55, but it's trading at uh, 68 right now and you just don't want to pull the trigger on it until you get that pullback. But when you're looking at it, uh, you're thinking, you know, I'm just sitting in cash right now, and I have this kind of opinion on XYZ stock. What can I do? Well, step one of what you can do, you can sell a put to get into the stock. Let's say that you are fine owning XYZ stock at 55 uh, you can sell the 55 put, and you're obligated to buy the stock at 55, which is a price that you're fine owning it anyway, uh, and you get paid to do it. So if the stock goes down to the 55 level, you can then be long the stock at your desired price and get paid to do so from the, the premium obligation of the put. You're fine owning it at that price anyway. But let's say it doesn't quite dip down to that level the put will expire worthless, and you at least got paid for your time of looking at the stock while waiting. Now, that's a, a fairly basic uh, strategy that a lot of people use when wanting to get into a stock. But let's make this a little bit more complicated. After all, this is the strategy block, and let's have some fun with this. Let's say, for example, that XYZ stock is in the mid-60s, and you uh, would really like to own it at 55 and you actually have a sentiment that, you know what, I'm pretty sure it's going to pull back to 55. And I like the idea of getting uh, some money or some premium, so to speak, for selling the put to get into the stock. But if it actually goes down to 55, I want to make a little bit more than that because I want to be a little bit more aggressive on this pullback. Well, what's something I can do? You can do a one-by-two ratio front put spread and that you can buy the 60 put for, we'll just say for sake of easy math, $2, and then you can simultaneously sell two 55 puts for $1 each. Now, by doing that, the premium that you're getting from the 55 puts is going to finance the cost of the 60 put. So with that being said, you have a free ride from 60 to 55. Meaning if that stock expires right at six, right at 55, your 60 put is worth $5, the 55 puts expire worthless. So with that being said, you found a way to take advantage 
of the pullback on the stock. Now, with that being said, let's say it continues to go below 55. Well, remember, you're fine owning the stock at 55 anyway. So by setting up this 1 by 2 ratio put spread, you have the ability to profit from a pullback without having to shell out any premium for a put option to the downside. Now, of course, you need to be prepared to own the stock, and you need to be able to take on the risk of owning that stock. But this is a strategy that I've used with clients many times when a stock is above the levels with which we feel comfortable owning it, and what we want to do is actually have the ability to profit from the downside and still have a bullish long-term approach to the stock should we actually get into the stock at that specific level. So it's the one by two ratio put spread. Uh, you would need a level three trading clearance to do it at most brokers where you can do a debit spread along with selling a cash secured put. And uh, in the long-term section of the portfolio, this is one to where uh, I think this is a, a strategy that's a, a, a great tool to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I'm sure the guys over at uh, at OX, uh, I forgot what level that would be for approval to do that one by two spread there, Rob. Oh, you'd need a level three for that. I'm actually a level three serpent in my uh, Dungeons and Dragons league, at least, with <laughs> plus four with plus four energy propulsion. <laughs> oh, plus four energy propulsion. I know, I know. Well, then you get so, to do naked calls with if you have plus four uh, energy. Plus four energy, energy propulsion. Propulsion. Yeah, and I've got, I've got, I've actually got thirty-eight hit points. <laughs> As usual, we've gone to a dark, dark place, and I kind of like it actually. That's not just a silly place to be. Uh, only Sebastian is left doing the uh, the pen and paper role playing from the eighties here. He, he's, he, I guess, he's refused to go into the online era where everyone else That's is, exactly is right. playing on their computers, and you're sitting there at home with your twenty sided die. Well, no. Well, I like to dress in the clothes. Oh, you go full. Thing. You go the what's yeah. live action role playing, larping. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's you. You that's get the up way and work. And yes, <laughs> that's what I'm. I'm known for is uh, I'm the king of the live action role playing game. You gather in fields on the weekends, you and your your dwarven friends, and you have at each other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. For those of you that don't know what we're talking about. Being a live action role player is just a, a, I would say at least three or four notches below Civil War reenactor. <laughs> <laughs> just go watch the movie Role Models if you haven't <laughs> about what, what that stuff is about. Uh, and with that, uh, with that fantastic coda, we will wrap up the strategy block. As always, Uncle Mike, very scintillating, very informative, a lot for our listeners to digest. And with that, we will move on into our final segment. Around the Block. Around the Block. And welcome to Around the Block. This is where we talk about some of the interesting things that are on the horizon for us. And obviously, with this time of year, it's earnings, earnings, earnings. We saw some big players announce last week. We have some more big players announcing tonight. Let's just do a final uh, a final wrap-up. While you guys think about what earnings you're watching for the next couple of days, I will pull up. Yeah, Apple's back up to 302 now, so they've come back a little bit. They've come back about five points. And they were down about 297 for a while there. So I guess the world isn't ending completely for Apple, but it's not exactly uh, lighting the world on fire anymore either. And then here we are, IBM. We are printing 137. They're down about five points, and they're holding – Holding steady right around there, so uh, not looking too great for either of these bellwethers. Looks like we'll probably be opening up a little bit weaker tomorrow based on all this news. But aside from uh, aside from these two, what other names are you guys watching for the next couple of sessions? Oh, I've been I've been keeping an eye on a lot of different things. I think there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, any of the banks, Goldman Sachs. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on. Uh, you know, Ford is going to have earnings sometime soon. Yeah, not quite yet. Um, Goldman Sachs is this week. I think Wells Fargo is, if they're not, Goldman Sachs is tomorrow. I think Fargo is tomorrow too. Fargo is on Wednesday. And I think we got, you know, a few of the bank stocks, I think, with um, all the kind of foreclosure stuff could really – drive things. I think that, that really could. Um, obviously, 
you know, you get stuff like Microsoft could matter. Um, yeah, yeah, especially, like I said, if that rumor that we're hearing now is true, that they're putting a, a billion-dollar marketing campaign behind their their latest product, that's going to move the needle regardless of how good the product is. Yeah, and okay, well, they, that, that's, that, like, that's Bill Gates, like, Drops his wallet and a couple of bills fall out, and that's that's what comes out of out of there. But who else? So, how many other firms can muster that kind of marketing muscle for just for the holiday season alone? Uh, I mean, that's, have, that's insane. Yeah, they have massive amounts of capital. Well, and they they did see some success. I mean, I think uh, the Bing search engine actually did get some uh, pull into the market. Um, yeah, you're right. I guess and, if you discount that Jerry Seinfeld fiasco, they had some decent marketing lately. <laughs> yeah. Once you get past him and Bill Gates eating churros and trying on shoes, I still don't know what the hell that was about. No, I don't get it. Spend half a billion on that, I think. <laughs> well, mostly just paying Jerry Seinfeld for his appearance. Yeah, you're right. You're uh, right. You know, and the other thing that might be interesting is pay attention to kind of uh, some of the um, hotels – and some of the, like, Las Vegas Sands and different things like that, I think those could be really interesting as kind of I, – I feel like the hotels are actually a better leading indicator than the leading indicators. You know, if the hotels start saying, hey, we're seeing a little bit of uptick in traffic, that means things are really turning around. If they're not saying that, then look out. So those would be the things I'll be looking at. I think you probably should mention, too, that we mentioned them in the odd blog, but keep an eye on LNC. Obviously, rumors are floating that they're going to pop soon. That's definitely one you want to keep an eye on, I think, just because, like I said, if these LBO rumors are are correct for LNC, that's a lot of acronyms I know we're throwing around there. But if these rumors yeah. are correct, then the LNC might be looking for a pop to the upside in the near term. So to keep an yeah, eye on that S- in your radar. STX is another one that there's all sorts of huge LBO rumors with. Um, Seagate Technologies. So... It's like we're yeah, back in the 80s all over again. Barbarians at the gates. LBO. I know. I know. It's great. So, greed is good. No, just kidding. Well, Mike and uh, Rob, you guys looking at anything for the next couple of sessions? Uh, I think Thursday is going to be a really big earning day. It's You're seeing a really diverse uh, group of companies uh, reporting on Thursday. Uh, it seems to be uh, a really pharmaceutical heavy day. We have uh, Baxter, Lilly. And I can't remember the other, uh, other big name. Uh, Claxco, just Smith Klein, I think, is uh, reporting on Thursday. Uh, seeing Union Pacific and uh, McDonald's uh, reporting. So those are kind of some uh, some blue chip stocks. And uh, McDonald's has almost been since they've they've gone to that dollar menu. Uh, has almost been a uh, an economic indicator in and of itself. Is it seems like when uh, when things are getting really bad, they're doing really well. So uh, that's kind of a stock to watch. Uh, and uh, we see Caterpillar uh, as far as the durable goods and, and heavy machinery. Uh, you know, we have a really data-heavy uh, week this week. Uh, and on top of earnings, it seems like every day we have uh, two or three uh, significant uh, economic reports uh, coming out as well. Uh, we have the, uh, of course, the the Fed's beige book coming out on on Wednesday. Uh, housing starts, building permits tomorrow, and uh, the uh, Chicago PMI, uh, Michigan sentiment coming out on on Friday, uh, and durable goods orders on on Wednesday. So, uh, just a ton of economic data to digest on top of the earnings. So, uh, probably going to be a really volatile week. And a uh, very unpredictable week, to, to say the least. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm seeing, too, in that uh, you guys will probably be busy over at the trade desk at OX, and that uh, with the financials having a lot of earnings, the if you just look at a chart of XLF, it's like been channeling within the 14, 15 range, a little bit of a drop-off in August, but for the most part, it's been channeling for a long time, and if there's something that can – uh, make it break out, it would be the earnings, and then combine that with all the economic data this week, uh, there's definitely a lot going on, to say the least. Indeed, indeed. And with that, we will wrap up the Around the Block segment and call a close to this episode of the Option Block. Thanks again for listening, and be sure, if you haven't, to subscribe to our feed in the iTunes 
music store as well as to download or stream the shows from all the various outlets that it is available, including the optionsinsider.com and Option Pit and many other places. If you want to learn more about what Mike Tussaud and the guys over at Know Your Options are up to, then go to knowyouroptionsinc.com. If you want to hear more of uh, Mr. Sebastian's rants about Apple and the market, then go to optionpit.com. Is it Option Pit or Options Pit? You know, they both go to the same spot. Oh, you got so them both? Okay, smart man. I bought, bought them all. The, uh, and then, of course, Options Express, you know where to find them. It's call up and ask for Rob and say, I heard you on the option block, and I want personal service, and he will attend to you personally. <laughs> He uses that line in bars now. Did you know that? When he goes out to the bars, he goes, I don't know if you've heard this. I will attend to you personally. (laughs) I'm on a podcast called The Acid Block, and I'll attend to you personally. All right, guys. Thanks again for uh, for coming on to this remote episode of The Option Block, and we'll see you all next time. Become a part of The Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of The Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved.